I think I heard that, sir. Of course, the autopilots have been around in airplanes for years. Uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to make sure y'all understood is uh, that's that's you're going to see on a test is this uh, is this thing we call IZ Max. So when we look at our data sheets, that that the knee current is given, but the maximum current is not given. So when we look at our data sheets, you can look all day long, and we and what we got to do is we've got to operate that zener. We got to operate it somewhere between here. So we got IZ Max down here. If you exceed my IZ Max over here, then the thing's going to burn up. If you operate it be below IZK, then it's going to go out of regulation. But IZ Max is not given in the data sheets. So what, how do we come up with IZ Max? What is given in the, what's the three things that we need to know about the Zener when we buy it? Well, I'm going to start with the main things. We need to know BZ. And we need to know PZ. And then the third thing down here would be the tolerance. So I know BZ and I know PZ. And I know power is equal to V times I. So if I rearrange that formula, I got I is equal to what? P over V. So if I know the maximum power rating of the thing, so IZ max, that should be in your formula sheet too is equal to the power rating of the zener. These are one watt zeners divided by VZ. So they don't give it to you because it's so dang easy to calculate. So the actual formula is uh, IZ max. I put one up there. Is equal to PZ over VZ. And that's the way we calculate IZ max. Is that on the form sheet? It's not, it should be. And IZ max is not given. Now, why is that important to know? What if you operated above IZ max, what could happen? It could burn up. If you operate it, if you operate it below IZK, it's going to go out of regulation. So here's our power supply, guys. We've gone through the whole thing. We're going to add more to the regulator here. We got transformers <coughs> that's going to set our output dochies. We got rectifiers that's going to convert uh, 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 AC into pulsating DC. We got a filter that's going to convert pulsating DC into unregulated DC. We got a regulator that's going to convert unregulated DC into regulated DC. And this is the makeup of what we call a linear power supply. We're going to play around with these regulators. Uh, we got what, and think about it. I mean, there's a lot more to it. But if I was to take this whole circuit right here, here comes my unregulated end. Then I take this off and run this into a bipolar transistor. I've got an input, I've got an output, and I've got a common. So what I can do is take the entire regulating circuit and integrate it on a single piece of silicone. And I end up with what we call a three-terminal regulator. One of the leads is going to be labeled, is going to be unregulated in, the other one's going to be regulated out, and the other one's going to be common. And you can get these suckers just about any voltage you want. And uh, like the 7800 series is a, their one amp regulator. And there was a lot more into it because they got over. If you get them too hot, they'll cut off. If you try to work them too hard, they'll cut off. There's a lot of stuff in there besides a zener and a resistor and a bipolar transistor. But it don't make any difference to me what's in there. Why? 
because it's got regulated out, unregulated in, and a comma. If it's not regulating, then something's wrong with the regulator. That's what's nice about integrated circuits. We don't fix integrated circuits, but we got to know what they do. If we know what they do and they don't do what they're supposed to do, then there's what? They're, they're bad. Of course, you need to check your unregulated in. If your unregulated in is wrong, then your regulator can't regulate something that's wrong, right? You understand that? Yeah, so I'm, I've got a five volt regulator and my unregulated is sitting down at three volts. It's not, I can't get five volts out of three volts. So your unregulated voltage has always got to be more than what you're regulating, right? Y'all understand that? Uh, we've got variable regulators. We got one called a 723. And it's a three terminal regulator, but it's a, it's a variable regulator. And I'll show y'all that one. And this is a really neat too. This is what the trainer uses. So basically what you do is you, uh, you got three terminals on it. Oops. So you're going to have unregulated in, right? You're going to have regulated out. And then you set up a resistor network right here that I'll show you how to do it. And this would be pin three. And then you put a rheostat down here or a pot wired as a rheostat. And then you adjust this guy down here to adjust your voltage. And that's a three terminal, that's a variable three terminal regulator. So that means if I set it for five volts, it would do what? It would regulate it five volts. This is what the trainer used. Uh, normally, if it's, if it's got LM, that means it's a linear device and it's a 723. LM 723. And this is what the trainer used. So when you turn those little knobs down there to set your voltage, all you're doing is turning that guy right there. And what it does, it allows you to do what? It allows you to vary your voltage. So the 7800 series, uh, these are fixed regulators. Actually, it's like that. These are what we call fixed, reg fixed regulators. And then we got a 7900. These are positive regulators. We got the 7900 series. These are negative regulators. And then a 723. I don't know what the negative regulator. And we got a negative. Uh, we'll look at the trainer and see what they use. But you can see how they can take the whole regulating circuit because all you need access to is unregulated in, regulated out, and then a common. Now the variables, it's regulated in, regulated out, and adjust. So the third lead is the adjust. But these are going to be in certain ranges. So like a 7805 is a 5 volt regulator. 7812 is a 12 volt regulator. 7815 is a 15 volt regulator. So you're still connected. You're still tied to a, a, a company that puts out certain regulators, right? And if you need something in between, then you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to design it yourself. But if they're not, it's not that hard to me. It's not that hard to design. Uh, this is not exactly true. These, one of the big power supplies that we're using now is what we call a switch mode power supply. And we're not going to get into a lot of detail on this. They're really hard to design. And they're really hard to repair. But these guys, what's nice about the switch mode power supplies is we operate them at such a high frequency that all your capacitors and all your other components are real small. So these are real small power supplies. So those little those little old bricks we call them or little cubes you buy to charge your cell phone, those are switch mode power supplies. Uh, this right here is a switch mode power supply. But if this thing right here goes bad, you don't want to even try it. Maybe you want to go out by your universal power Yeah, because you can't fix it. Because they're so, because the way they operate is they, they operate on feedback. And the problem is you get into troubleshooting and everything checks right, but it's not starting. 
because so it's got startup conditions and all this other kind of stuff. It starts up and everything measures good, but it still don't start. So they're real hard to troubleshoot. But basically, it deals it deals with we bring in a we have a switcher. So this is an electronic switch guy a switcher right here. So this is electronic, and then we bring that into an inductor. The inductor is filtering. This thing is uh, the one I've got up here. Is, I'm gonna switch it at about. 15 kilohertz, so this is way up there. Uh, then it's going to come in. Uh, this guy right here is going to prevent it from blowing up my source over there. Uh, this inductor is your filter. It's going to smooth it out. Uh, then we're going to have a, a post filter, and then this is going to be our loadout. So what we're doing with this switching, we're using something called a uh, Pulse width modulation. Sounds a big technical term, right? So what our switcher, uh, what our switcher is doing is uh, generating this guy, generating this like this. So the first thing we do on the switch mode power supply is we rectify the AC. That's the first thing we do. And then we run it to a switching circuit that basically just switches. So this is zero, this is this is this is plus, this is zero. And what the switch mode power supply does is it comes in here and varies what we call the duty cycle. So I'm gonna vary the duty cycle. Can you see uh can you see what's changing? I'm not changing the frequency, I'm just changing the percent of the period that this thing is at its maximum value. So right here, my duty cycle will be getting better. Here, my duty will be getting bigger. So 100% duty cycle would be DC. And then when I come over here, my duty cycle would be getting smaller. So here, the duty cycle would be around what we call 50%. So it means it's it's. It's at its maximum value 50 percent, and at its, low, its minimum value 50 percent. Now I don't know if you're noticing it, but this is on the other side. So this is the circuit I have hooked up. It's right there. So this is my switching, and I'm bringing this in, and I'm using about 22 kilohertz. And then I'm, my diode, my inductor, my filter, and then my load. So this is what's coming into the filter. This is what's coming into the inductor. So this is what's coming into the inductor. This is what's across the load. So see what that, see what the inductor's doing? It's taking that duty cycle and it's turning it into DC. It's filtering out, it's filtering out all that garbage. And notice if I increase my duty cycle, my DC goes up. See the blue line? If I, if I decrease my duty cycle, my DC goes down. And this is a, this is a switch mode power supply. So all it's got to do is, all it's got to do to regulate is monitor this output right here. If the output goes up, it lowers the duty cycle. If the output goes down, it raises the duty. And that's all there is to these things. But they're very expensive. They're, I'm sorry, they're not expensive. They're very efficient. They're just hard to design and hard to troubleshoot. And they generate a bunch of noise on the, the line. Alabama Power, so you'd have to add a, a filtering circuit because what would happen is we'd be unloading and unloading our power, our, our uh, uh, Alabama power, and it would switch, it would backfeed into the line and create a lot of noise. These things create a lot of noise. So where do you run into switch mode power supplies at? So all those little blocks you have are switch mode power supplies. That's one big advantage since they run at such high frequencies. Your transformers become more efficient. Your capacitors can be a lot smaller. Your inductors can be a lot smaller. 
which means the whole power supply can be small, right? You understand that. Linear power supplies are going to be big, but they're easy to troubleshoot and they're easy to design. And also your big power supplies, I mean your your 450,000 watt power supplies, those are going to be linear power supplies. We just can't, a switching power supply just can't handle it. So your high wattage power supplies are still going to be linear power supplies. But these little old power supplies like this, this is a switch mode power supply. If this was a linear power supply, it'd probably be about five times bigger than this. Can you imagine carrying that thing around? <laughs> that little old brick would be this big instead of that big. You know, I'm the little cube. But what do you do when one of those things go out? They usually seal them up, by the way. You can't even fix them. They'll put it, they'll fill them up with epoxy, so you can't even fix them anyway. But normally, one of these power supplies go out, you just do that. Well, you know why they build the power supply on here because I don't. I we we, charge, we use this guy to charge batteries. I mean, wouldn't it be a wouldn't it be the pits if I had to have my power supply with me all the time? So, like your tablet and your cell phone. If, so, if the power supply if it didn't have a battery. So, what we're doing on those is there's batteries inside the unit. And I don't want a cable that I plug into the wall. So if I was to put the power supply inside my phone, then that brick would have to fit inside your phone. And then you would have to have a power cord that plugged into a, an outlet somewhere, plug into that to charge your phone. To, to, de to decrease the size. So you take that you take that power supply on the outside and put it inside. That's going to increase the size of the of the unit. Uh, and it's up it's it's up to them. A lot of your TVs now they're trying to make TVs so thin. Uh, a lot of them have external power supply. If you got a flat, if you got an LED flat screen TV, odds are it's got an external power supply. How many of y'all got a? I do. It's got an external. It's got your. Well, mine does. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about. I'm talking about these guys. Yeah, yeah. Not those. Yeah. Usually those. The, mine. Everyone that I've got has got an external power. Supply. But it's no big deal. It's just power supply. No. Well, it's, it's up to the engineer, you know. And undoubtedly, my answer would be they didn't have enough room to put it in there and maintain the size that they were choosing for. So that would be the same thing. Uh, these guys, uh, so this has an internal power supply on it. But odds are it's a switching power supply. What's that? Yeah, you should you should have got the old TVs, the flyback transformer. If you wanted voltage, you'd use one of those. Uh, the uh, the li the liquid crystals. We call these LED displays, but these are liquid crystal displays. It's just that the first liquid crystal displays were, were backlit by fluorescent bulbs. So that you see how much fatter some of these are. Well, these have a big fluorescent bulb in the back that backlights the liquid crystal. So liquid crystals don't create light. Liquid crystals control light to sorry things. So all they do is either, either let the light go, they either block it or they let it pass through. The LED displays are still liquid crystal displays, but they're backlit by LEDs. So that's why you differentiate between the two. So all of them are, are, are LCD displays. You're turning on, uh, each, if you're doing an LED, an LED has a voltage drop of around 2 volt. volt. If you looked inside that, and they probably hooked those things in series. 
you looked at that, you know, two votes per LED, you got a, you got 500 LEDs. <laughs> they're not, not all in series, but they're probably built in rows and columns. So you'd be probably talking about quite a bit of votes is just to turn on all those LEDs. Because if you hook two LEDs in series, then it's going to take four votes to turn them on. If you put two of them in series, three, that's six votes to turn them on. You know, if you put 10 of them in series, that's going to be 200 volts to turn them on. And that's where you get into a five volt power supply. Huh? Yeah, but it probably don't have, those things probably got enough current to key because LEDs need about 15 milliamps to run. So, you know, 50, milli, 50 milliamps. The, the lethal, the lethal current is considered to be around 50 milliamps. But the threshold current is what we call the threshold, which means you can feel, feel it. The pain threshold is down around five, six milliamps. So yeah, you get into a high voltage, a higher voltage that's got six milliamps available, you're gonna feel it. It's rated on side. It's, uh, I'd have to go look. Nine volt. Nine volt don't pull out, put out a have the ability to pull out enough current. I don't know. That's the way I check a nine volt battery. I don't know if you ever seen. I touch them to my thumb, and it don't burn me. So nine volt batteries don't put out. Now, if you took a, you took a few of them and put them in parallel. Now, what we do, well, the higher voltage is going to require less current to run the same load, right? You understand? And so that's why we put batteries in series to raise the voltage. So the lower the voltage is that the, that the circuit is designed for, then the more current is going to be required to run the load. You understand that, right? So I is equal to P over V. So if I'm trying to produce so much power, then the higher I can make the V, the, le the less the I is required to do that. So that's why our hand drills are going up. What they're 20, 20 volt drills now. They're still they're still using the same batteries, probably. It's got the same current capabilities, but you know. You got 10 amps at, tw at 20 volts. That's that's 200 watts. You know, you got 10 amps at 18 volts. That's that's uh, 1800 watts. Lithium batteries have a have a slower discharge. They have the ability to discharge slower. So batteries are rated in what we call amper hours. Amper hours is the number of hours you can run it and still maintain a, a reasonable output. So lithium batteries has a slower discharge. So if it's rated at 100 milliamps, a lithium battery would give you more amper hours than a, a regular alkaline battery. Also, a lithium battery doesn't get a memory. So if you've got a lithium battery that's rechargeable, it doesn't get a memory. NICADs will get a memory. So I mean the NICAD battery, if you keep those suckers charged, they're going to discharge better. So if you keep a NICAD battery on a charger all the time, I mean y'all might have had that. My wife's bad about leaving stuff on charge. Yeah. Yeah, those the old cameras or the old power drills. Well people get those old power drills that use the, the NICADs and they'll leave the dang battery packs on the charger all the time. And then they notice all of a sudden they come up there and where, where it used to last two hours, now it lasts 15 minutes because they do what? So NICADs, what you need to do is you need to do what? You need to charge them suckers up and let them run down. Then charge them up and let them run down. If you do that, they'll last you a long, long time. Lithium batteries don't have a memory. So lithium batteries, and that's one big advantage of lithium batteries, they don't get a memory. So you can charge them, you can live on charge all the time. And if, it, if you got five hours out before, you get five hours out before. They say it's better on lithium batteries never to pull the charge. And they say on lithium batteries it's never good to let them totally run down. But, uh, I've never had any problems with it. That's just one article that I read. Let's go back here. Good graces, it's time to get out of here. We're getting talking about this stuff. What we'll do next class. <laughs> Uh, yeah, next class is we'll we'll uh, we'll look at some power supplies. We'll look at the schematics on the trainer, and we'll look at those power supplies. And every, you'll see everything in there we talked about. And then we'll go back and actually look at the trainer and look at the power supply. And 
I wish I could find the one Courtney had. <laughs> and I told him. To, I told Yeah, I told him. I told him he had to keep it. <laughs> okay, guys. See y'all. See y'all. Have a good weekend. <laughs> You don't watch it. <laughs>